Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, behalf, I'm here on behalf of Attorney General Kilmartin to testify in support of uh, Chairman Craven's Bill 7075 and Representative Canario's Bill uh, 7688. We have filed written testimony on both bills, so I will be as brief as possible because you have a long night ahead of you. In regards to uh, 7075, the bump stock, when the tragedy in Las Vegas happened in the fall, we uh, as an office were forced to look at the current state of Rhode Island general law to see if the use and possession of bump stocks were illegal under Rhode Island law. Our office made a determination of two things. One, if you used a bump stock in um, tandem with a firearm, that would make the gun uh, an automatic firearm, therefore illegal under Rhode Island general laws. We also made the determination that it, it would probably be able to charge, most likely, that if a person was in possession of, with a gun in a bump stock but not attached, that it was had the possibility of becoming an automatic firearm, therefore illegal under Rhode Island law. However, the mere possession of a bump stock would not be illegal under Rhode Island law. Chairman Craven's bill makes it perfectly clear that these devices are unlawful under Rhode Island law. It gives a clear definition of what it is, whether it needs to be amended for more clarity is something for you to decide, but it does provide clear uh, language for the individual to know what activity is criminal, which as we know in criminal justice laws is of the utmost importance. We were trying to fit a square into a round hole this legislation would fix that. In the testimony we provided, I did provide you a letter that the Attorney General, along with his Attorney's General colleagues across the country, sent to Congress regarding this issue so you would have it for your records. On 7688, which is uh, the, the known red flag bill, the Attorney General is in full support of this legislation. We do have some technical amendments that we'd like to work with uh, Chairman Keeble and Representative Canario and House staff on, but uh, I would stress that a majority of those are technical in nature. Um, I will say that we think one of the biggest solutions to uh, the gun control or gun violence crisis we're having right now is that we really have no ability to keep firearms out of the hands of people who are struggling with mental health issues, who are struggling with substance use issues, who um, offer threats of violence, and this legislation would solve that. I will note that we don't have a real mechanism to report these things to the NICS database. And I know that's uh, some sort of confusion that we've heard in other committees, but in 2014, when the General Assembly made its last NICS improvement, I would say, that was only for civil commitments adjudicated by the district court. There is no mental health information going into the NICS system. That would have to come from the physician, his or herself, Federal law requires that mental health and substance use be submitted, but it has to be submitted by the uh, treating doctor. And we don't have a HIPAA exemption for that. There's a lot of reasons why, and that's another policy debate, but I will say that information is not being reported into NICS right now, which makes something like this so significant for saving lives in our community. And I want to mention a couple of stats for, for you from our neighbors from Connecticut. They've had what they call risk warrants, same thing since 1999. From 1999 to 2013, 762 risk warrants have been issued. Of those 762, in 99% of those casements, cases, firearms were found. Think about that. In 762 of these risk warrants, firearms were found in 99% of the time. That mechanism saves lives. And in those 99 cases, an average of seven firearms were found per individual. That's striking. I think that um, this is a fantastic bill. The Attorney General fully believes in this bill, and we look forward to working with the committee to make it as tight as possible and to protect our citizens. Thank you. Any questions for Joey? Representative O'Grady. Uh, thank you, Joey. Um, I want to put the same question to you that I put to Representative Canario earlier. I've had uh, some constituents approach me with some due process concerns, mm. and specifically on the um, the process by which an ex a temporary extreme risk protection order might be issued. Um, is that are there other restraining order processes that work 
in that way, or would this be sort of a, a unique one-off? My understanding of uh, the restraining order process is that all restraining orders have an, ex uh, an emergency restraining order temporary portion to it. And then you do have the full hearing where uh, there's the opportunity to be heard. But all of the restraining orders in district and family court have that emergency capability. Uh, Vice Chairwoman Ajello. Joey, the statistics that you just cited regarding Connecticut were astonishing. Since I just want to repeat them to be sure that I have them correct first. Yes. You said since 1999, there have been more than 700 risk warrants served? Issued. Issued. And in 99% of those cases, guns were found. Yes. And the average number of guns found was seven. Yes. That, can't, that comes from the Educational Fund to Stop Violence. Now, these risk <coughs> warrants issued, are they essentially what we are looking to establish with this red, red flag bill? They are very similar, I will say, in the five states that have uh, created this warrant order that's happening. All of the language is very similar. They might be off a little bit for days to hearing. Uh, judicial standards at the hearing, some use preponderance, some years use clear and convincing, but their premise is very much the same. I believe in Connecticut, and I don't want to say this wrong to you, in Connecticut it might be limited just to law enforcement and not to family members as well. I believe that Connecticut and Indiana is law enforcement only, and then Oregon, Washington, and California are law enforcement and family members. Don't quote me on that, but I think that that may be the difference. That, that raises an interesting question for me. So in Connecticut, then, you think, uh, the family member needs to go to law enforcement to begin the petition process. And a doctor might go to law enforcement to begin the process. Am I correct? Yes. It would, be, it would be like any other witness complaint, yes. Thank you. Yes, Representative Flippy. Has there been any antidotal evidence about, from the jurisdictions where only officers can initiate the process? Has there been any evidence or examples of where not allowing a family member to initiate the process has led to uh, an incident? I'm not, um, I don't know, Representative Philippi. Um, the, the research that we found, there's not a lot out there uh, regarding the risk, the extreme risk warrants or the risk warrants, what we're calling them. The b best amount of information that we have seen comes from Connecticut, and that is a law enforcement only state. There isn't a lot of data because the Washington and Oregon and California laws really took effect in the last couple of years. There's not enough time. I, I actually like the idea of the law enforcement only because my concern is that a family member could use this as a tool of harassment, uh, and that does happen, and I think a law enforcement officer might be more of a neutral arbiter uh, as almost a gateway before it does get to court and this process, this expensive process, and intrusive process begins. Uh, my concern is that this, this could be abused by a, a family member. Um, so I do like the idea of only allowing law enforcement to initiate this. Uh, going back to the bump stock bill, I just, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. It's the Attorney General's position that if a bump stock is attached to a firearm, that's illegal. If a bump stock is found near a firearm, that's illegal? Depending on the fact, I mean, that would be really, like when I say that we're tr we were trying to fit a round peg in a square hole for the purposes of saying, you know, what would have happened if it would have happened here, I will say that if it was attached to that, it becomes an automatic firearm. If it's the bump stock, they, there's only in the one pool, right? And, and do you it, have an extreme, like a high level of confidence in that analysis of our statutory framework that it would be currently I, I illegal? Don't, I don't think that we would have said it out loud if we didn't. I, has, but, has, it ever, <laughs> has it ever been tested? But no, it hasn't. Because thank you know. Thank God for, you know, we haven't had a scenario here. I think that's... But a scenario could just be someone possessing one on a, on a 
Absolutely. on a rifle. And it could be, it could be, it could be the, um, there's a bump stock in the garage or a storage unit and he has a gun at home. That makes that, the fact basis makes that a very different analysis. Could you get there? Maybe. The point is, if you put this law into place, you know, everyone knows what the law is. But you are sure a bump stock standing on its own isn't illegal? That's correct. Okay. That is, that is correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Price. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so, Jody, the, if someone uh, swears under oath or sw on a sworn affidavit, um, and, it, and it comes up to be that they're being untruthful, lying about it, whatever, do, do they automatically get um, uh, perjured? Perjured for that, and or <laughs> or is it the, up to the person that they were filing a petition against have to take them to court in order to to yeah, get to get the uh, depending on what the facts look like. Uh, if there was a allegation of perjury that would be reported to a law enforcement agency who would investigate it if it was appropriate for charges to be brought they would in our office it would review and review them for charging i believe perjury is a 20-year felony um so it would be a significant case for review under our by our office but there would have to be a complaint filed with a law enforcement agency oh f from the person that was accused correct well no for the person accusing the person accuses and then get perjured, then the person that was accused has to file to have the perjury charges pressed? Correct. Okay, thanks. Representative Knight. Joey, sometimes the judge can refer things for investigation on a perjury matter, isn't that correct? Yes. Right. 